So someone asks, um, are there people today who have temporal lobe epilepsy? Is it treatable? Um, the answer is yes, actually. Temporal lobe epilepsy is still not uncommon today. Um, again, if there's a nidus, a little area that doesn't present you wouldn't otherwise see anything in this person. Um, it may turn into temporal lobe epilepsy, but it is very treatable, and people are basically treated with anticonvulsants. And, but, and one of the questions we've had is, uh, if he had lived today and, and he would have been treated, uh, would he have been Vincent Van Gogh? And it's hard. You know, one, we, we are who we are. It's uh, if, if if we if we were if we were medically treated, we wouldn't be the same person. Right. So I, it's one one has to wonder but, would but, he? But one has to be careful also. Yes. Not to uh, not to take from that that he wouldn't have been an artist or wouldn't have been a great artist if he hadn't had this terrible mental affliction. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a, a better way to look at it is that his art really is the product of his whole life, mm -hmm. and his illness was a part of that life. So that his life would have been different, and but he still would have been an artist and and still would have created art. Um, it may not have been as as revolutionary as it was, it may not have been as, as immune from the influences of the artists around him because he couldn't create relationships with them as it was, but it, I, I don't think there's any question he would have created great art. Well, I think, I think one thing that you know, patients will often ask me if they're involved in the arts is if I treat my bipolar disorder, because a lot of people who are very creative do, do have bipolar disorder, you know, if I medicate myself, will I lose my creativity? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's ongoingly debated. There's nothing inherent about bipolar disorder that should make you creative. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think that many artists' work comes out of their emotional state, right? right? So if you're suffering, if you have mm -hmm. angst, and you pour your angst into your work and you make that come alive, that's what touches people, that's mm -hmm. what they resonate with. Um, on the one hand, but during Vincent's sickest periods, he really did not produce. It was really as he came yeah. out of those most impaired times mm -hmm. and was, yes, maybe he was a little hypomanic, so he produced right. an incredible right. amount, and he could reflect back perhaps on painful times, but, dur but during times of no, great but impairment, he, did not. he really could not produce. Just as Pollock, uh, or the other artist we worked with who was an alcoholic, uh, he never painted when he was drunk. You know, um, Can I take 30 seconds to, to, yes. to be a little personal about this? Um, the, um, at the end of his life, you know, when he was at San, both at Arles in the hospital and at San Remy in the asylum, well, I think what affected him more than the treatment or the illness was the uh, effect on his life of being treated. And he was, he was uh, confined in a cell. Uh, at first, a cell he couldn't get out of, didn't even have a window in the, in the hospital. And uh, they, would, they wouldn't even let him out into the courtyard for a breath of fresh air because they were so afraid he'd hurt himself after his uh, ear incident. Then he moved to San Remy, and for a while he was, felt a lot better, but he was still confined. He was watched. He was followed everywhere, had to have an attendant with him. And then he, he went through a series of attacks. He would have these terrible, terrible seizures, lose consciousness, not know what, would wake up, not know what he'd done, be terrified of what he'd done, thought he'd, you know, had he hurt somebody, had he embarrassed the family, was Theo going to come rushing down again? So he lived with this terrible fear. And the personal part of it is, um, during the, toward the end of the writing of this book, I had uh, um, a series of, uh, of well, uh, medical problems, a cerebral hemorrhage, um, and, and was rushed to the emergency room at Duke Medical Center, and was confined and had hallucinations. Um, and, uh, and what that led me to believe, or to see, I think, more clearly, is that because of his confinement, because of his sense of the precariousness of his health, because he could be hit by a seizure at any time, and it could, they can come once a month, they can come every, twice a day, he didn't know. So with those moments when he had lucidity, when he had his life back, I think he felt them much more intensely mm -hmm. than he would have otherwise. And the best example is after one of the worst of his attacks, when he first came out of the hospital the first time after that attack, it was in spring of 1890, he walked into the courtyard of the asylum, this was the asylum of San Remy, and he saw this old um, almond tree with these wonderful twisted branches, but uh, uh, just ancient and all gnarled and, and diseased, but this huge burst of pink flowers, first flower of the spring. And I think my, my sense, 
and this I, I don't have scientific proof for this, is that he looked at that incredible view of that beautiful almond blossoming against that blue sky and thought, I've got to record that. I've got to put this down. I've got to put the, I've, I, I'll, I may never get a chance again to see this, to record it, to, to convey to others how beautiful this is, the incredible intensity of this moment. And so he immediately went to his canvas and he did the famous almond branches. And I think a lot of his late work has that intensity that came out of his, the, the incredible sense of precariousness he felt from being treated and having these, these terrible problems toward the end of his life.